Hello, I'm Svetlin Nako from Softunic Global. I'm a software engineer and a coding instructor who helped thousands of students to learn programming and start a tech job. I'm here for the next episode from my Dev Concept series. This one is one of the most important videos from this series because I talk about problem solving, which is an essential skill of every software engineer. I will dive deep into the skills of software engineers, what is algorithmic thinking and how to develop it, what are some approaches to solving tech problems. Because thinking as a developer is an essential skill for anyone involved in the software industry. So finally, I will explain how to approach exam problems as a student software coding problems at computer science and uh, programming exams. I'll give you best practices about how to read the problem statement, how to analyze the problem, how to visualize your ideas, how to design a solution and validate it before writing the code because this is the best practice and how to manage your time during the exam and how to avoid typical mistakes that many students do. So at the end, I will also do a live demo to show you my way of solving algorithmic problems with some simple uh, problem and I will call it in C sharp, but it's not quite important. And I will show you how to follow the recommendations from this video lesson to be more successful. I will go through a sample coding exam problem, which requires generating ideas, problem analysis, algorithm design, algorithm implementation, debugging, bug fixing, and many other steps uh, which you will meet uh, uh, during the, your uh, coding exams. So make sure first to like this video and to subscribe to my channel if you enjoyed this lesson. All right, let's start. In this section, I will explain the four essential skills of software engineers. Coding skills, algorithmic thinking and problem solving skills, understanding software engineering concepts and mastering software technologies. These are the four main skill groups that all programmers must have in order to practice software development successfully. Most of these skills are sustainable over time and are not affected by the advances of the technologies that are constantly changing. I will explain in detail these four essential groups of skills with focus on problem solving and algorithmic thinking. There are four main groups of skills that any skillful programmer has and to which every beginner must strive. Coding skills form 20% of developer skills. These coding skills Skills include the following components, writing code, using development environments, the so-called IDEs, and developer tools, working with variables and data, calculations, conditional statements and loops, using functions, methods, classes, objects, working with data structures such as arrays, lists, maps, strings, and trees, using programming APIs and libraries, troubleshooting and debugging the code. The skill of coding can be acquired after several months of hard learning and solving practical problems and writing code every day. At SoftUni, the coding skills are mastered at the first few training courses of our end-to-end -end software engineering program, the programming basics course, the programming fundamentals course, and in the next few courses, these skills are further developed. Remember that programming language does not matter for the ability to code. Coding, coding is essential skill, which once learned can be applied in many programming languages. To master the skill of coding, you need to invest two to three months of intensive training and coding every day. The second essential skill is algorithmic thinking and problem solving, which forms 30% of the developer's skills. Algorithmic thinking is a way of getting to a solution through the clear definitions of the steps needed. 
It includes the ability to break the problem into a logical sequence of steps called algorithm to find a solution for every separate step or break it further into sub-steps and then assemble these steps into a working solution. The algorithmic thinking is similar concept to logical thinking, engineering think thinking, mathematical thinking and abstract thinking. All these concepts are related to the ability to solve problems, to think logically, to analyze the problems and to find and implement solutions. Problem solving is more general skill, uh, while algorithmic thinking is more technical or engineering skill. Problem solving is the act of defining a problem, determining the cause of the problem, analyzing the problem, identifying, prioritizing, and selecting alternatives for a solution and implementing a solution successfully. In computer science, we deal with technical problem solving, which is the most important skill of any programmer. The ability to solve technical problems by breaking them into sequences of steps and implementing these steps with code. To master the skill of solving technical problems, it's necessary to invest 6 to 12 months of intensive training and practicing every day and to solve at least 1000 practical programming problems. The fundamental computer science and software engineering concepts form about 24% of developer skills. The fundamental computer science and software development concepts include many programming paradigms, essential software development knowledge and skills, software engineering principles and concepts that developers typically acquire as they gain experience over time. Some of these knowledge areas and concepts are the concept of object-oriented programming, OPE, working with classes, objects, inheritance, interfaces, and polymorphism. The concept of functional programming, FP, working with pure functions, declarative programming, and immutable data. The concept of asynchronous programming and parallel execution, working with threads, background tasks, promises, and others. Databases. Relational databases, the entity relationship model, the SQL language, as well as NoSQL databases, document oriented databases, the key value model, database engines, programming APIs and tools for database programming, and ORM frameworks. The concepts behind the web technologies, the HTTP protocol, front end web development, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Domain, JAX, REST. Backend web development, MVC frameworks, routing engines, templating engines, cloud technologies, and many others. Software engineering, development methodologies, agile principles, teamwork principles, source control systems, project management principles, quality assurance, and others. The basics of all these software development principles and engineering concepts are learned in the professional modules from the Soft Unique curriculum. See softunit.org slash curriculum. It takes one to two years of practical software development to learn the basics of these fundamental software development concepts. Developers learn these concepts in greater detail for many years as they gain more and more experience during their professional career path. These concepts are highly stable over the time. Once learned, they don't change significantly for decades. These principles of software engineering and development paradigms are independent of programming languages and specific technologies. The programming language does not matter for the assimilation of all these skills. Languages and software technologies, which form only 25% of the developer skills are what we see at the job offers for developers. Programming languages such as JavaScript, C Sharp, and Python 
software development technologies such as React, ASP.NET Core, and Django, software platforms such as Java EE and .NET Core, software libraries such as Apache Commons and ML.NET, development frameworks such as Spring MVC and Tangular, and developer tools such as NPM, Visual Studio, Webpack, and Maven are what we can see in the requirements in most job offers for software developers. But they are the last 25% of the developer skills. Here are some examples of commonly used software development stacks which software companies are looking for. C Sharp plus object-oriented programming plus functional programming plus .NET API classes plus MSQL server database plus entity framework plus ASP.NET MVC plus HTTP plus HTML plus CSS plus JavaScript plus DOM plus jQuery plus containers plus Quad. Another popular development stack is JavaScript, plus functional programming, plus object-oriented programming, databases, plus MongoDB or MySQL, plus HTTP, plus web programming, plus web front-end, HTML with CSS, JavaScript, DOM and jQuery, or Angular or React, plus web back-end uh, development, Node.js and Express, plus JavaScript tools, plus cloud technologies, plus containers. Another popular technology stack from the Python ecosystem is Python plus object-oriented programming, plus functional programming, plus databases, plus MongoDB or MySQL or PostgreSQL, plus HTTP, plus web development, plus HTML, plus CSS, plus JavaScript and DOM, plus jQuery, plus some MVC framework like Django or Flask, plus Cloud and containers. In the Java space, we have development stacks based on the following technologies. Java plus Java API classes plus object-oriented programming plus functional programming plus databases plus MySQL plus HTTP plus web programming uh, HTML plus CSS plus JS plus DOM plus jQuery plus JSP and servlets plus Spring MVC or Java EE uh, plus Cloud and containers. These technologies consist of large amount of technical knowledge which change very fast. Once you learn a software and technology uh, such as Angular 9 or Java EE 8, it will be outdated in few years or even months and new versions or entirely new technologies will come as a replacement. This is normal. Live with the understanding that technology is changing fast. What stays for long are the coding skills, algorithmic thinking and software development concepts and principles. The usual lifetime of modern software technologies is two to three years. Software technologies are highly dependent on the previous 75% uh, of the developer skills, which are strong coding skills, algorithmic thinking and problem solving, computer science, and development concepts. Some job offers for developers only publish a list of software technologies without even mentioning the coding skills, problem solving skills, and development concepts and principles. This is because employers assume that all developers should have these four groups of skills and that experience with software technologies proves that the applicant has also coding skills, algorithmic thinking and problem solving skills and understands the concepts and principles behind the modern software technologies. To be a software developer, you need to have all these four groups of essential developer skills. You should learn them either from your experience or from training and courses, from books or from all the sources combined. In addition to the tech skills, developers should also have soft skills, such as verbal and written communication skills, teamwork skills, the skill to work successfully with other people, organizational skills, time management, planning and prioritization, accountability, empathy, adaptability, creativity, attention to detail, and many others. For software developers, algorithmic thinking and problem-solving skills are essential 
and we shall explain them in deeper detail. Algorithmic or engineering or mathematical thinking is the ability to analyze problems and find solutions through the clear definition of the steps needed. Algorithmic thinking is the skill to break down a technical problem into steps which make up an algorithm and to further break down these steps into sub-steps when necessary and to assemble the solution from the output of the steps performed in the specified sequence. How to develop algorithmic thinking? Developing of algorithmic thinking is a process similar to the development of mathematical thinking. You should solve a lot of practical problems. Many, many, many problems. Algorithmic thinking is formed slowly and consistently through a lot of learning, reading about algorithms and data structures and a large amount of problem solving practice. Solve 1000 or more practical programming problems and you will get the foundations of algorithmic thinking. It takes six to 12 months of coding every day, practical problem solving, but once learned, this skill stays for a long time, even for a lifetime. At SoftUni, the algorithmic thinking and problem solving skills begin to develop during the programming basics and programming fundamentals courses and then expand further in subsequent modules and courses in the professional tracks. The end-to-end -end software engineering training program at SoftUni will first teach you coding, algorithmic thinking and technical problem solving skills and then we'll continue with modern software technologies combined with basic concepts and paradigms for software development. Programming languages do not matter for building algorithmic thinking. You can call it in C Sharp or in JavaScript or in the latest top rated programming language, but with insufficient algorithmic thinking, you will be a lamer. At the same time, if you code in the oldest and ugliest programming language, but with strong algorithmic thinking, your code will be correct, clean, fast, and elegant. From my 20 years teaching experience, I can highly recommend to take enough time to work algorithmic thinking and problem solving before you start learning the modern software development technologies. Many wannabe developers try to learn React or Java Enterprise or other modern technology without having strong coding skills and algorithmic thinking. They fail because they don't have enough skills and abstract thinking to be able to understand the concepts of the technology and the way it works internally. They don't even understand its syntax. It's better to spend more time solving algorithmic problems than to be a bad performer or untidy developer later. People who have strong algorithmic thinking, such as students with experience in programming competitions or top performers in algorithmic classes, have been shown to learn technology very, very fast learn algorithmic thinking and problem solving first. In this section, I will explain what a problem is by definition and what a problem solving is and how problem solving is related to logical and algorithmic thinking. I will pay special attention to technical problem solving and algorithm design. What is a problem? By definition, in our daily life, the problem is a question, situation, or puzzle requiring logical thought to find a solution. In physics and mathematics, a problem is a task that starts with certain conditions and aims to find, calculate, or demonstrate a fact, result, or wall. In programming, a problem is an assignment to design an algorithm and implement it by writing code to fulfill 
certain tasks such as taking an input, processing it and producing an output or building an application, website or software component. Problems have goals. Goals are what you wish to achieve, the final situation, product or result. When the goals are achieved, the problem is considered solved. In math and physics, the goals are to obtain certain result or proof or demonstrate something logically. In programming, the goals are to design and write a working code which corresponds to the assignment and its requirements. Problems may have some barriers which are obstacles that prevent the achievement of the goals. Barriers might be shortage of resources or absence of knowledge or skills to achieve the goals. The solution of the problem describes how to overcome the barriers. Without goals and barriers, there is no problem. The problem is the assignment to achieve, solve, build or calculate something by overcoming the barriers. Tech problem solving skills are what software engineers need to develop in order to be successful in their profession. At their future job, problem solving will be a daily activity. And this is the reason why problem solving is an important part of any technical interview. Remember that skilled software developers should have strong problem-solving skills. Without strong algorithmic thinking and problem-solving background, a developer will be a low performer who cannot grow much in the career. Tech problem-solving is the ability to think logically and solve tech problems. It is about decomposing problems into sequences of smaller sub-problems or steps. Solving these sub-problems and combining them to assemble the solution of the bigger problem. These sequences of steps called, algor called algorithms and their design is the essence of the tech problem solving. To be able to design algorithms, software engineers need to develop algorithmic thinking, which is also called logical thinking, mathematical thinking, or engineering thinking. This is a pragmatic solution-oriented thinking, uh, thinking approach, which aims to resolve tech problems by executing well-designed sequences of steps. Tech problem solving is the ability to analyze technical problems and propose solutions to find how input data or conditions can be transformed through a sequence of steps into the out output data or conditions using appropriate tools and resources. In programming and software engineering, tech problem solving is the ability to design algorithms and to implement them using programming languages and development tools. The algorithm, the steps to get the, the result, is encoded as sequence of comments or programming statements in the code. The algorithm can be very simple, as if there is no algorithm at all, or it can be quite complex, such that we have to read books or articles on how to design and implement it. Most everyday tasks that developers work on require simple sequences of steps and the algorithm design is straightforward. Remember that problem solving is essential for programming. Many candidate developers ask me whether they need strong math skills to become software developers and I always answer that they don't need math skills. They need algorithmic thinking and problem solving skills. Tech problem solving skills can be developed by solving a few thousand practical programming problems. And this is what we do in the end-to-end -end software engineering learning program at SoftUni.
solving math or physics problems at school requires similar problem solving skills. And this is the reason why good mathematicians, physicians, and people of scientific or engineering background learn programming and software technologies very quickly. Remember, it is not required to have strong math skills to become software developer. But it helps. It helps because math skills include tech problem solving skills and logical thinking. Learn algorithmic thinking and how to solve technical problems. Be patient. You will need to solve at least 1000 practical programming problems and spend a few thousand hours in algorithm design, coding, debugging to acquire these skills. But it will be worth for your future tech career. In this section, I will explain the main stages of problem solving, defining the problem, analyzing the problem, identifying potential solutions, choosing a solution, planning actions or algorithm, implementing the actions or algorithm, and reviewing the results of or testing. Solving a problem requires logical thinking or algorithmic thinking. It involves many stages like defining the problem, analyzing the problem, identifying potential solutions, choosing a solution, planning actions or algorithm, implementing the actions or algorithm, and reviewing the results or testing. Defining the problem is the first stage in problem solving. In software engineering, this stage is known as gathering requirements. Without well-defined requirements, writing software will be impossible or quite confusing. For bigger projects, there is a role in the projects called requirements analyst or business analyst who works with the customer to collect, analyze and organize the business requirements and describe them in a form understandable to the technical team. The next stage in problem solving is to analyze the problem. This includes to understand deeper the problem, its context, requirements, constraints and obstacles the people and objects and processes related to the problem and their properties and relationships. Based on this deep understanding of the problem, we can extract the important information from the requirements and discard the non-important information and explore the properties of the problem which will be useful for building a solution. The next stage in problem solving is to identify potential solutions. We generate and explore different ideas on how to find a solution. We analyze these ideas, their correctness, their strengths and weaknesses, their practical applicability and the costs of their implementation. Once we identify and analyze enough potential solutions, we evaluate them and choose a solution. Choosing a solution from several candidates is a decision-making process and depends mainly on the requirements, our capabilities and available resources, as well as the balance between the strengths and weaknesses of the candidate decisions. Once we have decided how to solve the problem, we build a detailed action plan or algorithm. And this plan is a sequence of actions, which we shall execute step by step and description for each action. We check whether our algorithm or action plan is correct and covers all requirements and whether we properly handle all possible situations at each step. Once we have clearly defined algorithm or action plan, we implement it. This means executing the planned steps or writing code to execute them. In software development, the implementation process includes also testing and debugging. The last stage of problem solving is to review the results or test the solution for programming problems. This includes asking yourself what has been done well and what can be done better to learn from our experience. For software problems, we need to perform testing of the solution. Check for usual and unusual input data, edge cases, and special cases. 
Let's take an example of real world problem. We want to buy a new laptop. To define the problem, we need to understand the context of the problem and to gather the requirements. Who will use this laptop? And for what purpose? Learning, gaming, watching movies, internet browsing, or other. What budget we have? From these questions, we shall gather the requirements. What brand, weight, processor, memory, storage, video card, screen size, camera, microphone, and other peripherals we need. For example, we need a laptop for learning software development. And we have a low to medium budget. And this is the main source of our requirements. Once we have a clear requirements, we can analyze the problem to understand it in more depth. We need a laptop for learning purposes. The brand is not important. So we can select uh, by the hardware specification. The weight is not much important. The processor should have at least four cores. The memory should be at least eight gigabytes, better 16 gigabytes. The storage should be fast, SSD or better or combined fast disk plus slow disk. The video card is not important. The screen should be large. The camera and microphone are not important. Also, we need uh, high quality headphones for listening uh, video lessons. Now we have deep understanding of what of the requirements and we can identify potential solutions. Our first idea is to purchase from online store in internet. We can search by specification, compare the hardware configuration, prices and ratings of the sellers. And once we have chosen the brand and model, we can find the best price on the internet. Delivery will take a few days, but we have uh, a very wide choice of options and flexibility. Our second idea is purchasing from a local hardware store. We can touch the laptop before the purchase. Availability will be limited, but the price might not be the best and we shall have the laptop immediately. Our third idea is to purchase from a second-hand market. This will give us a very good price, but we risk getting a problematic laptop that could be damaged in a few weeks or months. Evaluate and choose a solution. We have already identified the potential solutions to our problem, purchasing a laptop. We know there are strengths and weaknesses, and we know the hardware configuration we need and what budget we have. We choose to purchase a new laptop from an online store. The motivation behind this solution is that we need a new laptop with two to three years of warranty, modern and affordable hardware configuration for our needs, and we want the best price from highly rated seller. Now we have decided what to do. The next stage is to establish a plan or algorithm how to do it. We decide to find the top three online hardware stores, uh, search by parameters, compare the offers and prices and place an order. We will also ask friends uh, to recommend hardware stores and certain configurations and give advices. Now we understand well the problem and after detailed analysis, we have identified how to solve it and we have a plan. It's time to execute the plan to implement the algorithm. We contact our friends who we know are up to date with computers and hardware and we get their advice. We find the top three online stores by high ratings and good prices and we conduct searches. We compare price offers, uh, their strengths and weaknesses, and compare the prices. We choose the offer that we think is the best, and we place an order. We purchase high-end headphones separately, following a strong recommendation from a friend. 
After a few days, we received the delivery and we started installing, configuring and using our new laptop. We review the results and we answer ourselves. Are we happy of our purchase? How we can do it better? It may take a few weeks until we establish a strong opinion whether we made a good choice of hardware configuration, laptop model and online store. Sooner or later, we shall know uh, what we have done well and what we can do better. Now we shall illustrate the problem solving and logical thinking by a few examples. We will consider several logical and several technical problems. Let's start from a classical logical thinking problem. How to connect the nine dots using only four lines? At the figure, we can see the nine dots staying at a grid three by three. We want to connect these nine dots using only four straight lines, not more. How to do this? Think a bit, I'll give you a, a solution later. This is an example of four lines which attempt to connect the nine dots without a success. I can draw another example as well. Another classical logical thinking problem is shown on the screen. Where goes the missing piece from the above figure? See the animated transformation of the triangle at the top to the triangle at the bottom. We have one empty square more in the triangle below. Where it comes from? Think a bit and try to find the solution yourself. I'll give you hints and my solution later. Let's consider another classical logical thinking problem from the software development world. Measure five go ons using four go on and seven go on buckets. This problem is sometimes given to technical interviews for software developers to test logical thinking. Uh, you are mixing cement and the re recipe calls for five gallons of water. You have an unlimited amount of water, for example, a garden tap with the hose. And the constraint is that you have only four gallon bucket and seven gallon bucket. The problem is to find a method to measure five gallons. You can fill and pour the buckets and use separate containers without with a known volume. Think and try to find a solution for this puzzle. I'll give you a sample solution later. I want to give you another classical logical thinking problem for software developers. Find the counterfeit pile of coins among 10 piles of 10 coins. This problem is quite interesting because it is sometimes given to technical interviews for software engineering jobs to test logical and engineering thinking. Let's explain the problem in detail. You have 10 piles uh, of 10 gold coins each. All the coins in one of these piles are counterfeit and all the other coins are real. It is unknown which is the faulty pile. But it is granted that it's exactly one of the piles. Each real coin weighs 10 grams. Exactly 10 grams. Each counterfeit coin weighs 
11 grams. Exactly 11 grams. Fake coins are heavier. You can use an extremely accurate uh, digital weighting scale only once. You are only allowed to measure the exact weight of something and that's it. You cannot use the weighting scale more than once. Only one measurement is allowed. You must probably need to take some of the coins and measure their weight and this should be enough to solve the problem. The problem is to find a method to determine which set of 10 coins is faulty by using only one measurement. Think and try to find a solution for this puzzle. I will give you a simple solution later. Now I have a tech problem for you. Finding the largest parent long sublist in given list. Unlike previous problems, this one is purely pro programming challenge. We are given a list of letters and we want to find the longest sublist, which is a palindrome. A list is a palindrome if and only if it reads the same backward and forward. For example, A, B, B, A is a palindrome. But A, B, C is not a palindrome. Examples in the list A, B, C, 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 D. Uh, the largest palindrome sublist is C, C and its length is 2. The sublist C, C reads the same forward and backward. So it's a palindrome. In the list A, H, C, H, X, X, U, the largest palindrome is H, C, H. And its length is 3. The sublist H, C, H reads the same forward and backward. So it's a palindrome. In the list A, H, C, H, X, X, H, the largest palindrome is H, X, X, H. And its length is 4. In the list A, B, B, A, the largest palindrome is A, B, B, A, and its length is 4. The entire input list is a palindrome. It's time to help you find solutions of the previously mentioned simple logical and technical problems. I will give you some logical reasoning and analysis of these problems and guidelines on how to construct solutions. The nine dots logical thinking problem. Connect the dots using four straight lines. Let's think out of the box. Try this wise. First one, second one, third one, and fourth one. Voila! We connected the nine dots using four straight lines. What has changed? We changed our point of view. It is allowed to place the ends of the ones outside of the points. It's not forbidden. But it's not obvious. Some logical challenges require creative thinking. The missing piece logical thinking problem is to find where the missing empty square comes from. The animation reveals the difference between the triangles. Look at them carefully. The upper figure and the lower figure are not exactly the same. The upper figure is obviously smaller than the lower. From this difference comes the missing piece. At the lower figure, the gradient of the green is 
The green hypotenuse is different than the gradient of the red hypotenuse. To solve this problem, we need logical thinking. If the figure below appears to be the same size as the figure above, but unexpectedly an empty square appears from somewhere, there should be a difference between these two figures. Logical thinking will tell you, hey, let's compare these figures side by side. When we compare the figures side by side, the difference becomes obvious. Engineering thinking help us come up with an idea of how to solve the problem. The five gallons logical thinking problem is about measuring five gallons using a four gallon and seven gallon bucket. If we analyze this problem and play a bit with filling and pouring water between the given two buckets, we shall discover interesting properties. We can measure directly four gallons and seven gallons by filling the smaller and the larger buckets. We can fill the smaller bucket and pour it into the bigger bucket. Then fill the smaller bucket again and partially pour it into the bigger one. This way we can measure one go on, which is equal to two times four minus seven, which is two small buckets minus one back. Once we have measured one go on, we can add four go ons and the smaller bucket to it, and this will give us five gallons. Let's see how this happens in practice. We start from empty bucket. We fill the four gallon bucket. The small and the bigger buckets now have four and zero gallons respectively. We pour the four gallon bucket into the seven gallon bucket. The buckets now held zero and four go ons. We fill the four go on bucket again. The buckets now hold four and four go ons. We pour from the four go on bucket into the seven go on bucket until it fills to the brim we should have put three go -ons. from the smaller bucket to the larger one. At this moment, the seven go -on bucket will be filled to its full capacity and in the four go -on bucket will hold one go -on. Nice, we have successfully measured one go -on. We can use it further to measure different quantities of liquid. The buckets at this moment hold one and seven gallons respectively. Let's continue. We empty the seven gallon bucket. The buckets now hold one and zero gallons. We pour the one gallon from the four gallon bucket to the seven gallon bucket. The buckets now hold zero and one go on. We fill the four go on bucket for a third time. The buckets now hold, uh, hold four and one go on. We pour the four go on bucket into the seven go on bucket. The buckets now hold zero and five go on. Voila, we have solved the problem using logical thinking and creativity.
the 10 pals gold and counterfeit coins. Problem is about finding the pile which holds the counterfeit coins among the piles, which hold gold coins. We are given 10 piles, each holding 10 coins. Each one of the piles holds counterfeit coins. 10 coins each 11 grams, total 110 grams. The other 9 piles uh, hold real gold coins. 10 coins, each 10 grams, total 100 grams. We don't know which pile is fake. It can be this, or this, or this. All the piles look the same. We can measure the weight of something only once. How to find the fake pile? Let's analyze the problem. We have nine gold piles, each 100 grams. 10 coins by 10 grams. and one fake pile of 110 grams, 10 coins by 11 grams. We want to find which are the gold and which are the fake piles. We can measure the weight of something only once. This is the tricky moment. Why exactly once? If we can measure many times, we can measure each pile and find the fake. It will weigh 110 grams. But we should use only one measurement, only one. We should somehow measure all the piles together. We need to build a combination of coins from all the piles and measure them together. Because if we ignore some piles, the counterfeit may be among them and we will not be able to solve the problem using just one measurement. But if we build a combination of piles, how do we recognize which coin comes from which pile? We need a creative solution. We build a combination of coins by taking one coin from the first pile, uh, two coins from pile number two, three coins from pile number three, etc. Up to 10 coins from pile number 10. We have a total of 55 coins. If all the coins are real, they will weigh 550 grams. However, some coins will be counterfeit. And we can measure the total weight of all the coins together. And we can find which pile is fake. Let's see how. We can weigh all the coins together using the scale. It reads, for example, 500 
53 grams. The difference is 553 minus 550 and this is 3 grams. If all the coins were real gold, they would be 550, they would weigh 550 grams. But the measurement shows a difference of 3 grams. We can conclude that we have three counterfeit coins. Because each counterfeit coin adds to the total weight one gram. Counterfeit coins weights 11 instead of 10 grams. Therefore, these are the coins from pile number three. This fake pile number three, which holds three coins, weighing 33 grams. The other 10 piles holding the other 52 coins are real and their weight is 520 grams. 33 grams plus 520 grams. The weight of the counter fade coins plus the weight of the real coins equals to 533 grams the total weight. Conclusion Pound number 3 is counterfeit. If we had 7 counterfeit coins which come from the pile number 7 uh, the difference would be 7, right? In the same way if we had 4 counterfeit the coins from the fake pile. Number four, the difference would be four. You can check yourself that this algorithm will work for any fake pile from number one to number 10. Now it's time to solve the longest palindrome sublist problem. First, let's define the problem. We should have clear requirements. We are given a list of letters. We have many sublists in the input list. Some of them are palindromes. Uh, and our goal is to find the longest palindrome. Let's see examples. In this example, we have a palindrome of length two. And there is no other longer palindrome. In the following example, we have a list that is itself a palindrome and its length is 4. In this example, we have a palindrome sublist of length 3. Here we have palindrome sublist of length 5. The next stage of problem solving after defining the problem and its requirements is the problem analysis. It's important to notice that we have two types of palindromes. Even length palindromes and odd length palindromes. Odd length palindromes have one letter at the middle and the other letters are symmetrical around it. We call this scenario single central point. Even letter palindromes have two letters at the middle and the other letters are symmetrical around these two letters. We call this scenario double central point. These two cases might be handled by the same algorithm or separately with different algorithms. We shall see later, but it is good that we have examples of both cases. 
The next stage in problem solving is to identify potential solutions. Solution one is to find all possible start plus plus end positions and check for palindrome. The start can be any position and the end can be any position which is on the right from the start. Or is the start itself? This way we can find all sublists inside the input list. We can check each sublist whether it is a palindrome or not. We check whether the letter at the start position and at the end position are the same. We move the start to the right and the end to the left and we compare the letters at these positions again. We repeat the same until the end of moves before the start. This will mean a palindrome. If we find different letters at the start and at the end positions at some moment, this means that the sublist is not a palindrome. Finally, we can take the longest of all the palindromes we have found. Solution number two is to find all possible single central points and double central points and check for palindrome around them. We can assume each letter is a single central point. We can start from it and find how long palindrome we have. If the letters are different, if the letters are, uh, we can go left and right while possible and compare the letters left and right. If the letters are the same, we still have a palindrome. If the letters are different, the palindrome has ended on the previous step. We assume that each sequence of two consecutive EQO letter is a double central point. We can start from it and find how long palindrome we have. We can go left and right while possible and compare the letters left and right. If the letters are the same, we still have a palindrome. If the letters are different, the palindrome has ended at the previous step. This algorithm will find all palindromes and we can take the longest of them. Solution number three is to find also list of size n, the length of the input list, then also list of size n minus one, n minus two, and so on until one and check for palindrome uh, each sublist. The first palindrome we find will be the longest palindrome. We have
have three candidate solutions. Can you find more? You can try to find a different algorithm. I think that these three algorithms are enough for now. I ask myself the following question. Can we find the length of the longest palindrome without checking all palindromes in the list? This can potentially be the fastest solution uh, because it does not scan all possible palindromes. Only solution number three does not find all the palindromes, but only the longest one. Unfortunately, it's not the fastest solution because in the worst case, it will check all possible sublists in the input list. Now, let's think which is the most efficient solution. The efficiency can be different for these three solutions. Solution number one finds all possible sublists, which are of the order of n multiplied by n divided by 2 and checks for each sublist for palindrome, uh, which takes a single scan through its letters. The total number of operations uh, are of the order of n multiplied by n multiplied by n divided by 2, where n is the length of the input list. Solution number 2 takes it each letter and each two consecutive echo letters as central point and scans around it for palindromes. Finding all central points takes a single scan through the letters. Scanning for palindrome around given central point takes a single span, scan of maximum n letters. Hence, the total number of operations are of the order n multiplied by n. Solution number three finds all possible sublists. Uh, in the worst case, when which there are no palindromes of length bigger than one, and for each sublist performs a palindrome check. Therefore, the total number of operations are of the order n by n divided by 2 multiplied by n. Looks like solution number 2 is n times faster than the others and it is the most efficient solution among the candidates. We choose to implement it because it is easy to understand and to implement and has better performance than the other candidate solutions. So far, we have analyzed the problem, generated ideas for solutions and chosen the most reasonable idea. It is time to describe in more detail the algorithm behind this idea. The algorithm, the sequence of steps for solution number two is the following. Choose each letter as single central point and count how many letters around it form a palindrome. This is an illustration of how this works. H a central point. This is a palindrome around it. It has length of 1. The next H is the central point. This palindrome has length of 1. X a central point. The palindrome around it has length of 3. The H a central point. The palindrome around it has length of Five. The next X is central point. The palindrome around it has length of three. The last H is central point. Its palindrome has length one. We choose the longest among all the palindromes found. It is five in our example. Counting the palindrome length around given start and end position. 
can be done by comparing the letter at the start with the letter at the end. While possible and moving the start position right, the left and the end position right when the letter is the same. When the letter is different on or the right position goes out uh, before the left or the left position goes outside of the list, we stop. At the end, the difference between the start and the end positions corresponds to the longest palindrome length for the given central point. We need to handle also the second type of palindromes, which have a double central point. We can choose each two consecutive echo letters uh, as a central point and count how many letters around them form a palindrome. Counting the palindrome land around given start and end position is the same for this case. Only the start and the end positions are different. This is an illustration of how we can process all double central points. We try to take A and H as central point. We have no palindrome around them because they are different letters. Next, we try to take A and C as central point. Different letters, there is no palindrome. Now we take C and C as central point. We find a palindrome of length 4 around this central point. Next, we try C and H as central point. Different letters. Uh, no palindrome. H and X, no palindrome. H, uh, X and U, no palindrome. This algorithm will find all palindromes around every possible central point, uh, single or double, and finally we must choose the longest among all palindromes found. We have a clear idea how to solve this problem and we have prepared a detailed description of the algorithm. It's time to implement the algorithm to write the code. The function palindrome land uh, takes left index and right index as parameters. It calculates the length of the palindrome which has a central point at the specified start and end positions. The left index and the right index could be the same this is the case with single central point. The other case is when the left index and the right index differ by one. This is the case with double central points. How does this function scan for palindrome around given start and end? While both indexes are within the list, not outside. And we have echo, echo letters. We increase the right index, move it to the right, and we decrease the left index, move it to the left. 
this ends at different letters or uh, when the end of the list is reached. The return output is calculated as the difference between the right index and the left index minus 1. Uh, why? Because when we find the first difference, the palindrome has already ended in the previous step. This function will return 1 for single central points, which have no symmetric letters around them. This function will return 0 for double central points, which consist of different letters. This function will return 4 uh, Sorry This function will return 4 for the example at the screen where the left index starts from 2 and the right index start from 3. It starts from comparing C and C, equal letters, the left index goes left, the right index goes right. The next letters to compare are H and H. Equal letters, the left index goes left, and the right index goes right, right again. Now the letters to compare are A and X. Different letters. The whoop now stops. The returned result is the right index, which is 5, minus the left index, which is 0, minus y, which calculates to 4. The function returns 4 and this is the length of the palindrome around the letters C and C used as a central point. Now it will be easy to implement the longest palindrome sublist algorithm using the palindrome length function. We read the input list we first check all possible single central points, uh, single letter central points, and we remember the length of the longest palindrome uh, around uh, a single central point. We invoke palindrome length function uh, and we pass to it the central point C as start and end indexes. Then we check for all possible double central double letter central points and we remember the length of the longest palindrome around uh, the double central point. We invoke, we invoke palindrome length a function and we pass to it the central point C and uh, the next point on the right from it C plus 1 as start and end indexes. Finally we print the result. Now the problem is almost solved. The algorithm is implemented and the code is written. We need to review the results, test the code and debug it. If we find bugs and the next 
as the next stage of the problem solving process. We should answer the following questions. Does this solution work well for all cases? Are there any special edge cases for which our code fails? To answer these questions, we should test the code. We need to prepare test data, which covers the straightforward cases and the edge cases. As absolute minimum, we should test the code with input data covering the two main straightforward cases. A case where the largest palindrome, uh, the largest palindrome um, has a single central point. And the case where the largest palindrome has a double central point. As edge cases, we can consider a palindrome on the left side of the input list, on the right side of the input list, and input list consisting of distinct letter in which the longest palindrome has length one. This is an example of how we can prepare such well-designed test cases, which cover very well the discussed straightforward and edge cases. We start with a group of test cases consisting of distinct letters, ABC, ABCD, AB, and A. All these cases have their largest palindrome sublist consisting of a single letter. And the expected output is one. The next group of test cases holds palindrome consisting of two letters located on the left, uh, in the middle, or on the right of the input list. AA, AA0, 0AA, 0AA1, AABB, 01AA234, which AABB, which has two equivalent palindromes AA and BB. And all these sample input lists should return two as the length of the longest palindrome. All these test cases test the double central point scenario. The next group of test cases is a palindrome consisting of three letters as the length of the longest palindrome. All these sample inputs uh, these three letters can be located on the left, on the right, or in the middle of the input list. AAA, AAA0, 0AA, 0AAA1, 012, AAA34. All these sample input lists should return 3 as the length of the longest palindrome. And these test cases test the single central point scenario. We continue by testing with four letter palindromes, for example, AAAA, ABBA, 0A, BBA, XXXX0, and and 0ABB BA1, which all should return 4 as the longest length of a palindrome. These four letter palindromes will test again the double central point in less trivial variant than the palindromes of length 2. We can continue to test further with longer input lists and with longer palindromes, just to be sure the code works well. For example, 10 times x.
or 20 times x followed by z. If all these test cases work correctly, we can consider that our code is well tested and most probably it's correct. Finally, we should ask ourselves, can we solve this problem better? Are we satisfied with the algorithm, the implementation, the results, the tests performed and all other decisions we made? I'm quite satisfied with this algorithm. It is simple, easy to implement and the fastest from the ideas we initially had. After all, the test cases we executed, we can be convinced that this algorithm and our implementation are working properly, so I'm completely satisfied. In this section, I will give you some tips, ideas and best practices for solving exam problems, how to prepare for and take a programming exams and how to increase your efficiency and results when you take technical exams for software developers. These tips and proven practices come from my rich experience as a student, contestant and technical trainer, so you can trust them with great confidence. When taking a practical programming exam, the first thing you need to do at the beginning of the exam is to read carefully the problem description and analyze the problems. Do you have any idea how each problem can be solved, how difficult each problem is, uh, which is the most easy problem, how many time you expect each problem to take you, etc. Suppose you are at your programming fundamental practical exam at SoftUni. You have three problems to solve in four hours. You receive the problem descriptions of these problems at the beginning of the exam. My first tip is to start by carefully reading all the descriptions of the problems and trying to assess how difficult each of them is from your perspective. It's important to read the requirements, not to invent them. This means that instead of guessing what is required in the problem, you can check the problem description. Many students begin solving their exam problems before they read carefully the problems and later they find that they solve the wrong problem. Estimating how difficult a problem is, is only possible when you read the problem description, not only the examples. Estimate from your point of view. The problem can be difficult by nature, but it can be very easy for you just because you solved a similar problem the day before. Another problem can be easy for most students. It can be difficult for you because you are not strong in this type of problems. My second tip is to start solving the easiest or the fastest to solve problem first. Don't start with the difficult problems because you may fail. You have the biggest chance for success at the exam when you start with the easiest problem first. Leave the most difficult or the slowest to solve problem last. This means that when you start solving the most difficult problem, you have already solved or did your best to solve the less difficult problems. Estimate from your perspective what is easy and what is difficult uh, because you have to solve the problems. It is important what is easy for you, not for someone else. Approach the next problem uh, when the previous is well tested or you're conf confident that your solution is correct. For example, you get the maximum score from an automated exam grading system. This means that you should put enough attention to testing and polishing your solution. Often, a minor bug can make your solution entirely wrong or drastically reduce your score. And this can be fixed in just a few minutes if you test thoroughly. 
Don't skip the testing and bug fixing of your solution. But don't overdo it because it takes time. Your exam time is limited and you should get the maximum score for the time. Stop testing and bug fixing after you have covered the typical uh, straightforward cases and the most obvious edge cases or you have achieved 80% or more from the scores from the automated evaluation for the current problem. You can come back later to fix the bugs and debug the problem to get 100% of the score for it. Use a sheet of paper and a pen when you solve programming problems. Developers need paper and this is not old fashioned. Never start solving problem without a sheet of paper plus a pen. Trust me, I have very rich experience with programming contests and exams. Why do you need a sheet of paper and a pen? Because you need to sketch your ideas and you should do this fast. Paper and pen is the best visualization tool. It works faster than most digital tools. Okay, if you use A-Ink or other e-paper technology, uh, that's fine. But overall, traditional paper plus pen is the fastest way to sketch ideas. When you draw or sketch ideas with a paper and pen, you allow your brain to think visually. Visualization helps a lot with logical thinking. Complex technical problems are almost impossible to be solved without a sketch, drawing or other form of visualization of the examples. When you start, paper works, works faster than keyboard or screen. And that's why I recommend the old fashioned traditional paper. If you use e-paper technology, it will also work well, but visualization in Photoshop or MS Paint is a bad idea during the exam. Other visualization tools could also work well. If you have a specific problem and you have a good tool to visualize it, use it, it's fine. The most important point here is not to lose your time in drawing sketches in the wrong tool or skipping to sketch your ideas. Use your time wisely. To sketch your ideas, check their correctness, analyze them and choose the best solution approach. Don't spend your time trying to use the wrong tool. Visualize your thinking process, sketch your ideas, draw examples and sample input data. Think visually. This will increase your productivity and exam results. Preferred square paper. It works better for sketching and visualizing your ideas. Squares help building drawings, sketches, diagrams and plans. Square paper works best for algorithmic problems. Square paper allows to draw table easily. In many programming languages, uh, programming problems, you need tables. In this example, uh, in this example, you have a pricing table consisting of four columns: uh, ID, from, to, and price, and three rows, uh, which contain prices between uh, pairs of cities. It is easy to draw a coordinate system with objects in it. In many programming problems, you need a coordinate system. In graphical user interface, uh, GUI apps, you may need a coordinate system to sketch the user interface. In this example, we have a drawing of two rectangles on the coordinate system and their intersection. On a sheet of squared paper, it's easy to calculate distances. In many cases, distances between objects on the squared paper are visually obvious. The most important use of squared paper 
is to easily sketch a problem and solution ideas. Uh, the important point is that you want to be quick in sketching and testing ideas. You have limited time for the exam and you must use it wisely. In this example, we have sketched an idea how to find the left, right, uh, top and bottom sides of the objects in the coordinate system. If you have pens of different colors, take them for the exam. Some ideas can be illustrated better with different colors. I personally use only one color because it takes time to change pens, but it's personal. Some colorings quickly create excellent draw drawings using several colors. Exam time management is crucial to the success and achievement of the exam. Remember that at the exam you have limited time. Start with the problem which will take you the least time. This is usually the easiest problem, but it depends on your experience and previous exam preparation. If you want to achieve the highest possible exam results, you should solve the least time consuming problem first, then proceed with the problem which will take you the least time again. If you have one problem solved, start solving the least consuming problem as a natural next step. If you take a problem which is too difficult or time consuming, you may spend all your time on it and fail the exam. When you solve problems, it's usual to write almost correct solution that works for most input cases, but not for all. At this moment, you start debugging and bug fixing in order to improve your solution. Looking for bugs, debugging and bug fixing can be an almost endless process. It's quite important to know when to stop. Otherwise, you risk to spend all your exam time on debugging the first problem instead of solving the other problems. My tip is when you achieve a result 800 out of 100 or uh, higher uh, for a certain problem, do the following. Think carefully of edge cases uh, and try to handle them. Usually your program will fail for some edge cases. For example, if you have an array of numbers as input, try an empty array or uh, an array of just one element. Check the ranges of the input data in the problem description, if available, and try testing your code with input, which is close to the limits. Important. After you spend 10 to 15 minutes on testing and debugging the edge cases or trying to find why your solution is not entirely correct, stop. Just stop. Stop using your time. Spend your time on the next exam problems instead on a small portion of the current problem. Don't spend hours to pass the last 10% of the test. This is a very common mistake. Don't do it. Achieving a score of 80% to 90% of three problems is much better than 100% of just one problem. I have seen many times at the exams at SoftUni how students spend all their time trying to achieve 100% of the first problem. And after three or four hours, they say, oh, you don't have time for all the problems. The exam was very difficult. Or I had a bad work. I spent most of my time to find a stupid bug, which I finally fixed, but I didn't have time for the other problems. Don't do this. After you solve problem incompletely, give it some time for the edge cases and troubleshooting, but limit this time to 15 minutes. Now I'm going to discuss with you the most common typical mistakes at the programming exams. This list of common mistakes comes from my practical experience. I share it with you because I want you to learn from my rich experience at programming contests and exams. Wrong approach number one, start coding at the first five minutes. I have seen this many times. 
Students who start coding in the first five minutes usually fail at the exam. These students have not read the problems. How can you read the problems carefully so quickly? These students don't start with the easiest problem, but with the first one. This can be wrong in most cases. Starting coding too quickly means that you have skipped reading the problem description and have skipped doing the problem analysis and sketching the ideas to select and implement the best idea. An exception may be when you are very well prepared and there is no difficult problem for you. All problems are equally easy for you and in this case you can solve the problems as they are given. First, second, third, etc. Wrong approach number two. Don't use paid pen and paper. Students who come at the exam without pen and square paper or any other paper will most probably fail. These students try to invent solutions in their minds instead of visualizing their ideas on a sheet of paper. This is very, very, very wrong. Use your visual brain in the problem solving process. Sketch your ideas using the fastest drawing tool, paper and pen. Wrong approach number three, debugging the code in your mind. When a problem, a bug appears, many students try to find the bug by carefully reading the code. This may help, but using the built-in debugger is much, much better. You have a debugger in your IDE, the integrated development environment, such as Visual Studio or Eclipse. Learn how to use the debugger. This makes the difference between lemur and real programmer. Debugging the code means to execute it one by one or use breakpoints to stop at the interesting lines of code and monitor the values of the working variables during the execution. This will allow you to easily find bugs in the code. Students who don't use the debugger at the programming exams rarely have high results. Learn to use the debugger. This is a critical skill if you want to be a developer. Wrong approach number four, spend all the time at the first problem. This is quite common and I have already explained it as several times. Some students spend four hours or even more at the first exam problem. This is wrong. When you spend one hour at certain problem uh, without a significant progress, progress, go to the next problem. You can go back to the first problem later after you solve the others. Spend some time working on the other problems. You will probably have better success with them. Sometimes our brain gets stuck and we cannot continue thinking, generating new ideas or finding why your code does not work. It may happen to everyone. In this moment, you should change the thinking context by switching to another problem or take a short break. Wrong approach number five, spend hours trying to fix a bug. Some students spend several hours to move from uh, 90% to 100 persons for the first problem and never start solving the next problem. This is wrong. It's better to have several incompletely solved problems instead of only one problem solved 100%. My tip here is to move on to the next problem shortly after you reach 70 or to 90 percent of the scores or after 10 to 15 minutes of troubleshooting. Wrong approach number six, don't take a break when you walk. Everyone can walk, can get nervous or get angry or become distracted. It happens. In such a situation, take a short break. Go outside, breathe and calm down. Instead of working in an improductive mental state, try to change it. Wrong approach number seven, come to the exam unprepared. 
coming without preparation for the programming exam is a big mistake. Even if you are the smart and have strong programming skills, you need preparation. You need to practice solving problems while at the exam. Prepare yourself, study hard, practice a lot, solve sample exams. The best way to prepare for a particular exam is to solve the previous editions of the same exam. Find exam topics from previous classes and solve them. You are ready when you can solve any previous exam for a maximum of half the time allowed. If you can easily solve the exams from previous years for one to two hours out of the allowed four hours, you are ready. Wrong approach number eight, trying to cheat. Many students try to cheat at the exam, but this is a bad idea. Examples of cheating include getting help from friends or colleagues, sharing solutions code with friends or neighbors, taking solutions from a friend or colleague, working together with friends in a group at the individual exams and many others. The cheating techniques depend on the exam and the way it is conducted. Nevertheless, cheating is bad for you. With cheating, you can go ahead without learning what you are supposed to learn. And the next training course will be too difficult for you. If you have work and you are not caught for cheating several times in a row until you graduate, graduate what shall you do at the job interview? How shall you demonstrate what you have learned? Who will do your future job? Don't cheat at the exams. It's bad for your future. Hey, did you like this lesson? Do you want more? Join the Worders community at softuni.org. Subscribe to my YouTube channel to get more free video tutorials on coding, dev concepts and software development as well uh, of some hands-on uh, practical exercises with code lessons and project-based learning. Get access to more free dev lessons and learning resources for developers uh, and get free help from mentors and meet other learners. Yes, we provide a free mentorship and we answer your questions if you ask. So. This is absolutely free for everyone, so join now. Softuni.org. Meanwhile, you can check out my other videos from the code lessons with hands on exercises or from the dev lesson series, where I'll explain and demonstrate many concepts and technologies from the software development profession. Type in the comments below what topic you would like to see next and I'll try to record a video for you. Goodbye, see you in my next video.